Hello, I am Leila Anzog-Tolian. I am currently obtaining my degree in anthropology and history in the HAPS department. My project is Revolution Islam in the Female Body, a cultural anthropological perspective on religion and gender in the Iranian revolution. Scholarship pertaining to the study of revolution has missed an opportunity to utilize a cultural anthropological lens when observing the trajectories and outcomes of the Iranian revolution. The conflict between Iran's pre-revolutionary government and the rebels was based upon contrary notions of religion, gender, and processes of modernization. Despite these factors, scholarship has yet to utilize a more inclusive approach of anthropology when observing the trajectories and outcomes of this affair. This is especially true in regard to gender. Therefore, we will observe how theories of religion, gender, and ritual coalesce to form a revolutionary framework. Through the lens of cultural anthropology, the effects of the Iranian revolution on Iran's female citizenry can be understood in the context of societal norms and religious practices. This approach will distinguish the gendered aims of the revolutionary coalition. And it is important to note that women in Iran were not merely passive observers of revolution within their country, but they were in fact active participants. In order to fully understand the effects of the revolution on Iran's female population in respect to cultural anthropology, we will observe an overview of the events of the revolution. We will also analyze its impacts on women. And to do this, we will utilize a cultural anthropological approach to revolution by observing the relationship between religion, gender, and ritual. We will also observe how women resisted Islamic-based culture imposed after the revolution. Initially, the conflict stemmed from the overthrow of the Khwajar dynasty in 1921. With the help of outside actors, Raza Shah and his son Muhammad Raza Shah compelled Iran to open its ideological borders to outside influences. Thus, this resulted in a process of transcultural diffusion that the country had previously rejected in lieu of traditional society. Beginning in 1925, Raza Shah sought to elevate women's positions in society. He did this through women's employment, family laws, and the banning of the veil. However, Raza Shah's policies were viewed with mixed reactions. The Raza Shah's policies created hostilities between the government and the Shia clergy, who saw themselves as the guardians of Islamic culture. His actions and those of his son had rippling effects that enabled a revolutionary coalition to grow out of resentment for a rapidly changing society. Like his father, Muhammad Raza Shah failed to address the growing contempt of the religious elite for the government's process of secularization. In his disregard of the Shia clergy, the Shah lost the opportunity to mold Iranian values. Thus, as the Shah set out to implement firm Western structures, the religious elite maintained control behind the scenes, ultimately leading to his downfall. Scholars have come to refer to the Shah's structural transformation of Iranian society as the white revolution. Disenfranchised segments of the population, such as women and minorities, actually prospered under the Shah, at least for a time. However, as increased inflation became more rampant, the poor population were left with the burden. A portion of the poor population felt as though that they were excluded from the prosperity and that these disadvantages were generated by the advancement of women, which seemed to come at their expense. The Shah further generated animosity between the government and the religious class, when in 1967, he passed the Family Protection Act, which allowed women the ability to control divorce rights, obtain abortions, 
put their children in daycare so they could obtain a degree or work and allowed women to continue not observing veiling practices. However, this created even more resentment. Ayatollah Roloff Humani, the revolutionary leader of the insurgency, had been banished to exile in Iraq since 1963. And this was for his previous religious protests against the Shah's secularization of Iran. Even from Iraq, Homani posed an undeniable threat to the Shah's power. The violence ensued with the publication of a newspaper article that sought to discredit Homani's religious protests and also sought to discredit his growing coalition. Protests erupted from this in calm yachts in Tabriz. Events spiraled out of control with the banning or the burning of cinema wrecks in which 377 people were killed. The Shah tried to blame the religious fundamentalists while the revolutionary coalition tried to blame the Shah's secret police, the Savak. Despite his attempts to leave the country, disband Savak and put on trial the military and police personnel who had shot protesters, this was not enough to regain the confidence of the public. Therefore, Homani left his exile in 1979 and returned to Iran where he was greeted by 3 million people and the, the military made no attempt to block his return. This marked the beginning of the Islamic Republic. The new regime's policies and constitution revoked a significant number of women's rights. In 1979, Homani terminated the Family Protections Act and thus reversed protections that, on women such as marriage age, ages, divorce, and polygamy. Essentially, women were now unable to enact control over their own bodies and their status quickly reverted that back to the, that of the pre-Shah era. Further, under the discontinuation of the Family Protections Act, abortion was illegal and women were encouraged to cultivate large families. The mandatory veil was a way for the revolutionary coalition to control the female population, as well as legitimize their religious aims. While the Veiling Act did not come into effect fully until 1983, the Islamic Republic issued a decree that demanded that women observe Islamic forms of modest dress. The compulsory veiling was meant as a symbolic gesture of a rejection to Western culture. Even more telling of the severity of not following the Veiling Act, women were punished with 74 lashes if they did not observe this decree. Further, in preventing their participation in the public sphere, women were banned from participating in schools, libraries, and larger public in general, all in the name of Islam. Despite their supposed inability to hold public positions, young girls were thought to mature faster than that of boys, and thus girls as young as fifth or girls as young as nine years old were of legal age to marry, while for boys it was 15. Thus, without the defense of the Family Protection Act, women and young girls were unable to enact control over their own bodies, and there was no way to better their situation. To make this perfectly clear, the government made it so women were not able to procure a job without consent from a male guardian. Adultery was punishable by death and women's value was deemed half of that of a man's. Also to visually display this change that took root between the pre-revolutionary government and post-revolutionary government, the photo on the left is a picture from 1976 in which you can see women had their hair uncovered and they're wearing Western style clothing. However, the other picture was taken in 1986. And this is a more common image you would see after the revolution took hold in Iran.
In order to comprehend the motivations and trajectories of the Iranian revolution, cultural anthropological theory must be employed. The revolution was a battle over culture, societal norms, and religion. And through the lens of cultural anthropology, the effects of Iran's, revo of Iran's revolution on, on female citizenry can be understood in societal norms and religious practices. The economic and political shortcomings that descended upon Iran were viewed by the opposition as a consequence of Western culture and a lack of Islamic morality. For over 2000 years, Iran was dominated by different religions and hence religious texts constructed identity, status and rights for women. Notably in societies ruled by religious norms, gender is constructed within those norms. And thus religious texts expose the reasoning behind the way in which gender norms are constructed in society. Zoroastrianism was the official religion of Iran from 226 to 650 CE. And Zoroastrian texts such as the Gotha contained no specific gender. However, they influenced Islamic, Islamic religion. And the main message of the Gotha was peace, justice, and obedience. However, while the Gotha displayed no gendered ideologies, the Quran portrayed engendered elements that served to structure a separation of the sexes within society. For instance, the Quran creation story centered on the female's evil power to deceive and even suggested that they used evil and seduction to corrupt society and that of God. And thus, Islamic belief dictated that it was a woman's body and her sexuality that became an instrument of deception and seduction. In Iranian, in Iranian society before and after the revolution, the figure Fatima, daughter of the Prophet Muhammad and wife of Ali, was the personification of women's roles. She embodies modesty, motherhood, and obedience for women. And therefore, religion is very much tied into Iran's culture. And Faye Chubin, published in Women's Inter Studies International Forum, said it is not uncommon for conservative leaders and religious organizations to create moral panics out of changes in gender relations to compel people to support them. The shock the Shia clergy used religious anxiety tied to the opposition of female advancement to invoke massive opposition to the government. Anthropological religious theory calls this collective effervescence, which is when a passion or energy arises in a group of people that share the same thoughts and emotions. This is how much of the population was swept up into this revolutionary frame, this revolutionary fervor. While often used to analyze coming of age ceremonies, anthropologists suggested that Victor Turner's framework on ritual can be used to observe stages of revolution. Turner introduced the idea of social drama, which are public episodes of tensional eruption arising from conflict situations. And they manifest the organization and values of a group. Therefore, social drama manifested in the Iranian revolution as a rejection to secularization. Further, in regard to liminality and communitas, Turner saw the liminal stage as crucial with regard to the process of regenerative renewal. The experience of liminality yields communitas, which is the culmination of an ideal view of culture, purely spontaneous and self-generating. Thus, this diagram reflects the ritual stages of revolution. There is a moment of separation followed by liminality in which the state identity and structure is uncertain. After one party takes hold, they must engage in an act of reincorporation. In the Iranian revolution, this played out through policy change and ritual aimed at restructuring society. The idea that women had lost honor during the Pahlavi era was a widespread one. The coalition used the autonomy of women as a catalyst to invoke panic in the religious population. This becomes 
abundantly clear when observing Homani's use of gender in his construction of anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist, and nationalist and Islamic narratives. Also, as we can see in tying this to ritual, the act of veiling was used as a public ritual to show outside observers that Iran had transformed from a Western-based society back into one that observed traditional Islamic values. However, thousands of women resisted the reinstallment of patriarchal society. Groups of resistant women formed support networks to cope with repression. Iranian women used the government's symbolic forms of legitimization against them. For instance, women employed small acts of resistance such as the placement of their hijab to massive forms of protests. To really show this, an interviewee named Amine chose to wear what she described as a skimpy scarf. And she was attacked with a metal chain by two police officers in the town square for her protests. However, this violence did not stop women. As an interviewee, Shouk said, women have resisted this government by not observing the hijab, by showing up to work. The government's policy was to force women to swallow any shit, to humiliate women but it failed. After the Islamic Republic finalized their governmental control, women gathered in mass on women in International Women's Day in 1979 to protest the compulsory hijab and overall discriminatory policies against women. A spectacle of 15,000 women could be seen ducking behind parked cars and screaming down with Homani. During the march, the government, support, or government supporters of the new regime attacked these women. They were brutally beaten by the guardians of the revolution and also a mob as they shouted either head cover or hit on the head. These men who supported the revolutionary coalition called these women whores, bourgeoisie degenerates, un-Islamic and uncultured. However, these women continued to fight for their freedom. Further, protests started a dialogue between Iranian women about methods over using religious arguments or secular arguments and combating the government's discrimination. It was difficult for Iranian women to break away from religious arguments as religion was the basis for revolutionary change. Iranian women soon realized that feminism was synonymous with imperialism in Iran. And the Islamic Republic often used this argument against them. Yet despite persisting debates over religion versus over religious arguments versus secular ones, women continue to fight. And thus they are revolutionaries within their own right. Their protest is a counter revolution to the social order. Therefore, to return to the beginning of this presentation, why is cultural anthropology relevant to the study of the Iranian revolution? Well, it allows for the ability to understand the revolutionary coalition's rejection of Western modernization models. It also allows for an analysis of religious motivations based on the history of Islam. We can also observe the importance of gender in legitimizing the revolutionary coalition. And it provides theoretical comprehension of ritual, which reveals the motivations of public display or symbolism and societal control. And it also allows us an ability to utilize cultural relativism, which we need to not use a Eurocentric or a modernist approach to studying revolutions from other cultures. Thank you.